Act 4 Truth or illusion, George? You don't know the difference. Edward Alby, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf Chapter 1 A good rule of thumb, you know, when telling a story, is to delay all exposition until absolutely necessary. Nothing is more suspect, to my mind, than unsolicited explanation. It's best to keep quiet, to refrain from any elucidation until you have to. Now, it seems, we have reached that crucial point in the narrative. I owe you an explanation. I can see that. Remember that night in my flat? What I said about Jason and Kate? Whatever they have, or think they have, it will crack under the slightest bit of pressure. It will fall apart. What better way to test them, I said to Lana, than a little murder? Like one of the plays used to stage at the ruin, I said, in the old days. Remember? A little more gory, that's all. Lana looked confused. What are you talking about? I'm talking about a play for an audience of two. For Kate and Jason. A murder in five acts. Lana listened as I began to explain my idea. I said that, by faking Lana's murder and casting suspicion on Jason, we'd watch his relationship with Kate disintegrate. They'll turn on each other in an instant, I said. Don't think they won't. If you want to end their affair, just put that kind of pressure on it for a few hours. The two lovers would tear each other apart, each suspecting the other, and the moment each accused the other of murder, Lana could reveal herself. She would emerge from the shadows, having returned from death. She'd stand before them, gloriously alive, giving them the fright of their life, and leaving them in no doubt how they truly felt about each other, how shallow and tawdry, how easily polluted their feelings really were. It will be the end of them forever, I said. This is, no doubt, what appealed to Lana about my idea, the prospect of ending Jason and Kate's affair. Perhaps Lana was hoping to win Jason back, but she also had another reason for agreeing, a secret reason, which, as you will see, brought her little joy. The idea had a lovely poetic symmetry to it, I said. It provided the perfect revenge for Lana and the superlative artistic challenge for me. Of course, Lana didn't quite know how far I intended to take the performance. I didn't lie to her. All I did, you might say, was not burden her with a lot of unnecessary exposition. Instead, I concentrated on the practicalities of staging our drama. As we talked, we discovered the story together. Drowning, I said. No, shooting, said Lana, with a smile. That would be much better. We could use the guns in the house, then easily incriminate Jason in Kate's eyes. Yes, I said, that's it. Good idea. What about the others? Should we involve them or not? I knew we had to, to a certain extent. Lana and I couldn't pull this off on our own. For the illusion to work, Jason and Kate must never be allowed to get too close to Lana's body. I couldn't manage that by myself. I needed help. And Leo, hysterical, screaming, demanding they keep away from Lana, would do the trick nicely. I worried about how little acting experience Leo had. What if he wasn't up to the challenge? What if he corpsed, no pun intended, and gave the game away? Lana promised she'd rehearse him diligently until he was perfect. It seemed a matter of parental pride for her that he be given the part. Ironic, considering how much she disapproved of his becoming an actor. I agreed to her demands, even though I had my doubts about Leo, as I did about keeping Agathe in the dark. But Lana overruled me on both counts. What about Nikos, she said. Should we tell him or not? Let's keep him out of it, I said. Too many cooks and all that. Lana nodded. Okay, you're probably right. And so it was agreed. Four days later, on the island, a few minutes before midnight, I went to meet Lana at the ruin. I was armed with a shotgun. Lana was waiting for me, sitting on one of the broken columns. I smiled as I approached. She didn't smile back. I wasn't sure you'd be here, I said. Neither was I. Well? Lana nodded. I'm ready. Okay. I raised the gun and pointed it at the sky. I fired three times. I watched as Lana applied the fake blood and the stage makeup to herself. The bullet wounds were latex, gory and effective. At night, anyway. I wasn't sure how well they'd play in the daylight. The special effects were the model's own, procured for her by a makeup artist she had worked with on several movies. She said she needed them for a private performance, an apt description of our little production, I thought. Lana lay on the ground in the pool of fake blood. 
Then I pulled Kate's red shawl out of my back pocket and wrapped it around her shoulders. What's that for? Lana asked. Just a final touch. Now try not to move. Lie completely still. Let your limbs go limp. I know how to play dead, Elliot. I've done it before. Hearing the others approach, I went and hid behind the column. I stuffed the shotgun into a rosemary bush. Then I emerged a couple minutes later, acting as if I had just arrived, breathless and confused. From then on, I followed my dramatic instinct, seeing Lana lie there in a pool of blood with Leo, hysterical at her side, I found it easy to get caught up in the drama. It felt surprisingly real, in fact. I see now that's exactly where I took a wrong turn in my thinking. I didn't anticipate how real it would feel. I got so caught up with the twists and turns of the plot, I didn't think of how it would affect everyone emotionally. And that, therefore, people might react in highly unpredictable ways. You might say I forgot my most fundamental rule. Character is plot. And I paid the price for it. Chapter 2 Lana hurried through the olive grove in search of Agathe. She needed to find her. Lana had to calm her down before she ruined everything. It had been a mistake not to tell Agathe, to keep the plan a secret from her. But Lana felt she had no choice. Agathe would certainly have refused to take part, and she would have done her best to talk Lana out of it. Now Lana rather wished she had. A small figure was in the distance, through the trees, at the end of the path. It was Agathe, hurrying into the house. Lana quickly followed. At the back door, she took off her shoes, leaving them outside. She crept in, barefoot, silently, stealthily. She looked around. There was no sign of Agathe in the passage. Had she gone to her room, or the kitchen? Lana deliberated which direction to go in, when heavy footsteps, heading down the corridor, made up her mind for her. Lana turned and quickly climbed the stairs. A few seconds later, Jason appeared at the foot of the staircase. He nearly collided with Kate, who walked in through the back door. They had no idea Lana was there, at the top of the stairs, watching them. They're gone, Jason said. Kate stared at him. What? The guns, they're not there. Outside the back door, from the wings, I nudged Leo on stage. Go on, I whispered. Now's your cue. Leo ran inside and told Kate and Jason he had hidden the guns. That the guns weren't in the chest where Leo had hidden them was a surprise to him. I decided not to tell Leo that I'd moved them. I thought it would aid his performance if he was ignorant of that. As it was, I could see that Leo required no acting aid. The kid's a natural, I thought, a chip off the old block. His performance was frighteningly real in its hysteria and grief, a tour de force. She's dead, Leo screamed. Don't you even care? Lana watched from the gallery, craned her neck, trying to see Jason's reaction. This is what she had been waiting for. This was Lana's real reason for agreeing to my plan. She wanted to observe Jason's reaction to her death, to test his love. She wanted to see if Jason's heart would break, or at least glimpse some proof that he possessed one. She wanted to see him cry, see him weep for his beloved Lana. Well, she saw. Jason didn't shed a single tear. As Lana watched him from the top of the stairs, she saw he was angry and afraid, trying not to lose control. But he wasn't heartbroken or grief-stricken. He was entirely unmoved. He doesn't care, she thought. He doesn't give a damn. And in that moment, Lana felt herself die a second time. Tears filled her eyes, but not her tears. No, they belonged to a little girl from long ago who had once felt so unloved. A girl who used to crouch in this exact same position at the top of the stairs, clutching the banister, watching her mother entertain her men friends down below, feeling unwanted and ignored. That is, until her mother's friends began noticing her precocious beauty and her troubles really began. Lana had gone through so much since then, since those bleak, frightening days, to ensure that she became safe, respected, unassailable, and loved. But now, watching Jason from the top of the stairs, all that Cinderella magic vanished. Lana found herself right back where she started, a suffering little girl alone in the dark. Lana realized she was going to be sick. She pulled herself up. She ran to her bedroom into the bathroom. She fell to her knees in front of the toilet and threw up. Chapter 3 When Lana came out of the bathroom, she found Agathe was in her bedroom, waiting for her. There was silence for a moment. The two women stared at each other. Lana realized she needn't have worried Agathe losing control. There was no danger of an emotional outburst. 
Agathi looked entirely calm. Only her red eyes showed she had been recently crying. Agathi, please let me explain. Agathi spoke in a low, flat voice. What is this? A joke? A game? No, Lana hesitated. It's more complicated than that. Then what? I can tell you if you'll let me. How could you do this, Lana? Agathi searched her eyes, incredulous. How could you be so cruel? You let me think you died. You broke my heart. I'm sorry. No, I do not accept your apology. Let me tell you something, Lana. You are a most selfish, self-deluding person. I see all this, and I love you, because I thought you loved me. I do love you. No. Agathi rolled her eyes in angry contempt. Tears streamed down her cheeks. You are not capable. You do not know how to love. Lana stared at her, deeply pained. Selfish and self-deluding? Is that what you think? Perhaps. You're right. But I am capable of love. I love you. They stared at each other for an instant. Then Lana went on quietly. I need your help, Agathi. Let me try and explain. Please. Agathi didn't reply. She just stared at her. Chapter 4 Meanwhile, I reluctantly agreed to accompany Jason and Nikos on their search of the island, looking for a non-existent intruder. I felt increasingly resentful as we made our way along the coast, battered by the wind. I was exhausted, and my newest shoes had been ruined from wading through undergrowth, mud, and sand. I was also anxious to get back to Lana, and to Gothi. But Jason was proving annoyingly methodical in his search, intent on examining every square foot of the island. Even when we reached the cliffs, and it was finally obvious no boat was moored on the island, Jason refused to accept defeat. I think in some perverse way he was enjoying himself, acting like a hero in a bad movie. Let's keep going, he shouted, to be heard over the wind. Where, I shouted, there's no one here, let's go back. Jason shook his head. We have to search the buildings first. He shone his flashlight into Nikos's face, starting with his place. Nikos glared at him, blinking in the light. He didn't respond. Jason smiled. Is that a problem? Nikos shook his head, frowning. He didn't take his eyes off Jason. Good, Jason said. Come on. Not me, I said. I'll see you back at the house. Where are you going? To check on the others. Before Jason could object, I marched off. As I hurried along the path back to the house, I wondered whether Lana had managed to placate Agathi. Hopefully Lana had smoothed things over and persuaded her to play ball. But, knowing Agathi, I felt far from confident Lana would succeed. As I entered the house through the French windows, I looked around. There was no sign of anyone. I took the opportunity to crouch down by the long sofa, and, reaching underneath, I felt for the guns I'd hidden there earlier. I pulled out a revolver. I looked at it for a moment, feeling its weight in my hand. I checked the barrel. It was empty. I took out the bullets from my pockets. I had stolen a handful from the box in the gun room. I carefully loaded it. I didn't know much about guns, just the basics, taught to me by Lana, when Jason first acquired them. She learned to shoot on the set of a western she did, and we had a practice session, she and I, one afternoon on the island. I wasn't a bad shot. Even so, I was afraid of this weapon I was holding. My fingers were slightly trembling as I placed the gun in my pocket. I kept one hand on it, cautiously, through my trousers. I checked my reflection in the mirror. And there, reflected in the mirror, right behind me, was Lana's blood-stained corpse, staring at me with bloodshot eyes. I jumped and spun around. Lana looked fright, covered in bullet wounds, dried blood, and dirt. An incongruous sight in this elegant living room. I laughed. Christ, you scared me. What are you doing here? Get back to the ruin before Jason sees you. Lana didn't reply. She walked in and poured herself a drink. You went a bit off piss back there, love, running after a gothy like that. Take it from me. Nothing is more catastrophic than when an actress starts writing her own script. Always ends in tears. I was joking, trying to make her laugh. But it didn't work. Lana didn't even crack a smile. Where is everyone? I said. Where's Kate? In the summer house, with Leo. Good. He gave a marvelous performance, by the way. He's inherited your talent. He'll go far. Lana didn't reply. She took one of Kate's cigarettes from the table and lit it. I watched her smoke, feeling uneasy. You spoke to Agathi? Lana nodded and blew out a long line of smoke. I frowned. And? Did you square it with her? Has she given you her blessing? 
No, she has not. She's very upset. I laughed. You should have told her it was my idea. I did. And what did she say? That you're evil. That's a little dramatic. Anything else? That God will punish you. I think he already has. It's over, Elliot. Lana stubbed out the cigarette. She said this must stop. Now. Ah, I thought. So that was it. I try not to sound too annoyed. It's not finished yet. We still have the final act. Agathe has to wait until the curtain. It's curtain now. It's over. What about Jason? Lana shrugged. She whispered more to herself than to me. Jason doesn't care. He thinks I'm dead, and he doesn't care. She looked wretched as she said this. At last, I thought. At last, Lana was awake. At last, she had seen the light. I had been waiting for this moment. Now we could begin again, she and I, on an equal footing this time. We could begin again, with honesty and truth. Very well. It's over. What now? Lana shrugged. I have no idea. I have an idea, if you care to hear it. Despite herself, Lana glanced at me with faint curiosity. Well? It seemed like the moment for truth, so I went for it. Remember that night you first met Jason, on the South Bank? We've never spoken about that night. What about it? I had a ring on me. I was going to ask you to marry me. Lana looked up at me. I could see the surprise in her eyes. I smiled. But Jason got there first, unfortunately. I've often wondered what would have happened if you hadn't met him that night. Lana looked away. Nothing would have happened. Now it was my turn to look surprised. Nothing? She shrugged. You and I were friends, that's all. Were? I smiled. I was under the impression we still are. And a damn sight more than that, and you know it. I felt suddenly quite angry. Why can't you be honest with yourself, just for once? I love you, Lana. Leave him. Marry me. Lana stared at me, silent, as if she hadn't heard me. I mean it. Marry me, and be happy. It took all of my courage to say this. I held my breath. There was a long pause. Lana's response, when it came, was brutal. She laughed, a cold, hard laugh, like a slap in the face. And then what, she said? Fall down the stairs, like Barbara West? I felt like I'd been punched. I stared at her, stunned. I felt, well, you know me as well as anyone by now. You can imagine how I felt. I didn't trust myself to speak. I was afraid I might say something unforgivable, something that would cross an uncrossable line. So I didn't say anything. I turned and walked out. Chapter 5 I exited the same way I had entered. I went out through the French windows onto the veranda. I made my way down the steps, buffeted by the wind and by my thoughts. I couldn't believe what Lana had said to me. That mean joke about Barbara West. It was so unlike her. I didn't understand. Even now, as I write this, I struggled to comprehend her cruelty in that moment. It was so out of character. I couldn't believe it of my friend, of Lana. But perhaps I could believe it of that other, hidden person. That frightened girl lurking beneath the skin, so full of pain and wanting to lash out. I would forgive her, of course. I had to. I loved her. Even if, sometimes, she could be cruel. I was lost in a cloud of thought and didn't see Jason coming. I collided with him at the bottom of the steps. Jason shoved me back. What the fuck? Sorry, I was looking for you. Did you search Nikos' place? Jason nodded. Nothing there. Where is Nikos now? In his cottage. I told him to wait there until the police get here. Okay, good. Jason tried to pass me and climb the steps. I stopped him. Wait a minute, I said. I have good news. Agathe just spoke to the police. And? The wind has dropped. They're on their way over right now. A look of relief appeared on Jason's face. Oh, thank Christ for that. Shall we go and wait for them on the jetty? Jason nodded. Good idea. I'll meet you there. Wait a second. He gave me a suspicious look. Where are you going? To tell Kate. Unable to resist, I added, unless you prefer to? No, Jason shook his head. You do it. Jason turned on his heel, heading toward the beach and the jetty. I watched him go, smiling to myself. Then, keeping a firm grip on the revolver in my pocket, I went to find Kate to finish this. As I made my way to the summer house, I felt grimly determined to continue with my plan, whatever the cost. 
I won't lie and say my anger toward Lana at that moment didn't spur me on. But there was no way I could stop this now, despite Lana's objections. No more than you can stop a boulder you've sent rolling down a hill. It was bigger than all of us now. It had taken on its own momentum. We had no choice but to let this drama play out. As an actor, Lana should have understood that. I neared the summer house and saw the door open. Leo came out. I quickly hid behind a tree. I waited until he passed by. Then I crept over to the summer house window and peered inside. Kate was alone inside. She looked a mess. Scared, paranoid, upset. It had been a rough night for her. Unfortunately, it was about to get worse. I walked to the door. I reached out to open it. Then, unaccountably, I froze. I stood, motionless, paralyzed by a sudden and unexpected attack of stage fright. It had been many years since I'd done any acting, and never before had I played such an important role. Everything depended on my performance in this scene with Kate. This was the final magic trick I had to pull off. I needed to be 100% convincing. Everything I said and did had to seem entirely innocent and believable. In other words, I had to give the performance of my life. I steeled myself, then knocked loudly on the door. Kate, it's me. We need to talk. Chapter 6 Seeing it was me, Kate unlocked the door. I pushed it open and went inside the summer house. Lock it, she gestured at the door. I did as she asked, sliding the bolt across. I just saw Leo outside. I told him to meet us at the jetty. The jetty? The police are on their way. We're going there to wait, all of us. Kate didn't reply for a moment. I watched her closely. There was a slight sway to her movements, a slur to her words. But hopefully, she was sober enough to take in what I had to say. Kate, did you hear me? The police are coming. I heard. Where's Jason? Did you find anything? What happened? I shook my head. We searched the island top to bottom. And? Nothing. No boat? No boat, no intruder, no one's here but us. This clearly didn't come as much of a surprise to her. She nodded to herself. It's him. He killed her. Who are you talking about? Nikos, of course. No, I shook my head. It's not Nikos. Yes, it is. He's crazy. You just have to look at him. He's... he's dead. Kate stared at me, open-mouthed. What? Nikos is dead, I repeated quietly. What happened? I don't know. I wasn't there. I avoided eye contact as I said this. I felt Kate staring at me, feverishly trying to work me out. They were searching the north side of the island, where the cliffs are, and Nikos fell. That's what Jason said. That's what he told me, but I wasn't there. What are you trying to... Kate looked frightened. Where's Jason? He's at the jetty with the others. Kate stubbed out her cigarette. I'm going to find him. Wait, there's something I have to tell you. It can wait. No, it can't. Kate ignored me and walked to the door. It was now or never. He killed her, I said. Kate stopped. She looked at me. What? Jason killed Lana. Kate half laughed, but it turned into a choke. You're mad. Kate, listen. I know we don't always see eye to eye, but you're an old friend, and I don't want you to come to any harm. I need to warn you. Warn me? About what? This isn't going to be easy. I gestured at a chair. You want to sit down? Fuck off. I sighed, then spoke patiently. Okay, how much has Jason told you about his finances? Kate was bemused by the question. His what? So you don't know. He's in serious trouble. Lana found out he set up something like 17 different company accounts, all in her name, in private banks all around the world. He's been moving his clients' money around using her like a washing machine, like a fucking laundry. I bristled with indignation as I said this. I could see Kate taking it all in, weighing it up, weighing me up, working out whether to believe a word I said. I must say, my performance was pretty good, presumably because most of what I said was true. Jason was a crook, and I didn't think for one second that Kate didn't know this. That's bullshit, she said feebly. She didn't object further, so I went on, emboldened. Jason is about to be caught, if he hasn't been already. He'll be going away for a long time, I imagine. Unless someone bails him out, he needs money very badly. Kate laughed. You think he killed Lana for money? You're wrong. Jason wouldn't do that. 
He wouldn't kill her. I know he wouldn't. Kate stared at me, annoyed. Then what are you saying? I spoke slowly, patiently, as if to a child. She was wearing your shawl, Kate. A slight pause. She stared at me. What? That's why Jason followed her to the ruin. Because he thought she was you. Kate stared at me, silent. She had suddenly gone pale. It's true. Jason didn't mean to shoot Lana. He meant to shoot you. Kate shook her head violently. You're sick. You're fucking sick. Don't you understand? He's going to frame Nikos. Now he's made sure Nikos can't defend himself. I warned you not to make Jason choose between you. Lana was too valuable for him to give up, whereas you are expendable. As I said this, I could see the change in Kate's eyes. A kind of pain recognition. That word, expendable. It chimed with something deep within her. An old feeling, from long ago. A feeling that she wasn't important. Not special in any way. Not loved. She grabbed the back of the chair, like she was going to throw it at me. But she needed it to steady herself. She held on to it, looking like she might faint. I need to find Jason, she whispered. What? Haven't you heard a single word I said? I need to find him. Suddenly determined, she went to the door. I blocked her path. Kate, stop. Get out of my way. I need to find him. Wait. I reached into my pocket. Here. I pulled out the revolver. I held it out to her. Take it. Kate's eyes widened. Where did you get that? I found it in Jason's study, where he hid all the guns. I pressed the gun into her hands. Take it. No. Take it. Act like an idiot if you must, but take this with you. Please. Kate stared at me for a second. Then she made a decision. She took the revolver. I smiled. I stood aside and let her pass. Chapter 7 Gripping the gun, Kate walked out of the summer house. She went along the path in the direction of the coast, toward the beach and the jetty, in search of Jason. I waited for a moment. Then I followed. I felt nervous as I walked along the path. I had butterflies in my stomach, the way you do on a first night. It felt thrilling to have done this all. Written this drama, not with pen and paper, for fictional characters on a stage, but for real people in a real place. All of them, performing in a play they had no idea they were in. In a way, it was art. I really believed that. As I approached the beach, I could see the wind was calming down. Soon, the fury would have blown itself out, leaving destruction in its wake. I looked around for Kate. Sure enough, she was up ahead, making her way across the sand toward the jetty, where Jason was waiting. What would happen now? I knew the answer to that. I could predict the future as surely as if I had written it in my notebook, which, in fact, I had. Kate would climb up the stone steps to the jetty, Jason would see the gun in her hand, and being Jason, he would demand Kate hand it over to him. The question was, given what I had just told Kate, all the doubts about him that I had planted in her mind, would she give Jason the gun? More important, now that I had put a loaded gun in Kate's hand, would she use it? Soon, we would know the answer to the question I posed that night Lana came over, and I stayed up writing until dawn. Would I be able to contrive Jason's death without pulling the trigger myself? I felt confident that my plan had every chance of working, particularly as Kate played so completely into my hands. She was volatile at the best of times, and right now, she was also terrified, highly emotional and inebriated. There was every possibility that Kate might allow her feelings to overcome her. If I were a betting man, I'd say the odds were damn good. I took up my position by the tall pines at the end of the beach, near enough to have a good view, but not close enough to be seen, safely hidden in the shadows. My own private theater. Suddenly, I had a last-minute attack of nerves. Every playwright experiences this at some point, you know? An eleventh-hour panic. A fear that the story won't come together. Have I done enough? Will the structure hold? It's imperative to refrain from tinkering at this late stage. Many a great work of art has been ruined by the artist's inability to stop tampering with it. Many a criminal venture, too, no doubt. I had to trust in the work I had already done. What happened next was beyond my control. It was in the actor's hands now. I was merely a spectator. So, I settled in to watch the show. Chapter 8 Kate walked across the beach and over to the jetty. She slowly climbed up the stone steps. 
Jason was standing alone on the platform. They stood face to face. There was silence for a second. Jason spoke first, giving her a cautious look. Are you alone? Where are the others? Kate didn't reply. She just stared at him, tears welling up in her eyes. Jason watched her. He seemed uneasy, no doubt sensing something was wrong. Kate, are you okay? Kate shook her head. She didn't speak for a second. She gestured at the speedboat, moored below them. Can we just go? Get the fuck out of here. No, the police will be here soon. It's okay. No, it's not. Please, let's just go now. What's that? Jason was staring at the gun in her hand. He spoke in a sharper tone. Where the hell did you get that? I found it. Where? Give it to me. Jason stepped toward her, holding out his hand. Kate took a slight step back, an involuntary movement, but it opened up a chasm between them. Jason frowned. Give me the gun. I know how to use it. You don't. And then, Katie, come on. It's me. For a second, Kate believed in his authority, but then she saw his hand was trembling. She realized Jason was as scared as she was. Jason had every reason to be scared. Kate was out of control, clearly. He had to handle her somehow. He had to calm her down and bring her to a more rational state. He needed to reassure her, persuade her to give him the gun. So he took a calculated risk. I love you, he said. It was obvious from the look on her face that this gamble failed. Kate's expression hardened. Liar. In that instant I had been praying for arrived. A suspension of disbelief. A kind of theatrical alchemy. Call it what you will. Illusion became truth in Kate's mind. In her imagination, the idea that Jason was not to be trusted took hold. For the first time since knowing him, she felt afraid of him. This was made worse when Jason tried again, with more force. Give me the gun, Kate. No. Kate, did you kill her? What? Jason stared at her, incredulous. What? Did you kill Lana? Kate went on quickly. Elliot said you killed her, by mistake. He said you meant to kill me. What? Jason groaned. That's insane. That's a lie. Is it? Of course it is. He made a movement toward her. Give me the gun. No. Kate raised the gun. Stop. She pointed the gun at him. She was shaking so much it took both her hands to keep it steady. Jason took another step toward her. Listen to me. Elliot is a liar. Do you know how much she has left him? Millions. Think about it. Who do you trust, Kate? Me or him? Jason sounded so upset, so impassioned, so genuine, Kate found herself wanting to trust him. But it was too late. She didn't trust him. Keep away from me, Jason. I mean it. Keep back. Give me the gun. Now. Stop. Don't come any closer. But he kept moving toward her, step by step. Jason, stop. He kept coming closer. Stop. He kept walking. He held out his hand. Give it to me. It's me, for Christ's sake. It's Jason. But it wasn't him. It wasn't Jason. Not anymore. It wasn't the person she had known and loved. As if in a nightmare, he had transformed from a lover into a monster. Then he made a sudden lunge toward her, and Kate's fingers squeezed the trigger. She fired. But she missed, and Jason kept coming. Kate fired again, and again, and again. Finally, she hit her mark. Jason collapsed, and he tumbled down the jetty steps. He lay there motionless bleeding to death on the sand. I wish I could end the story there. Smashing ending, isn't it? It has everything you need. A man, a woman, a gun, a beach, moonlight. Hollywood would love it. But I can't end the story like that. Why not? Because it isn't true, unfortunately. That's not what happened. It's just a figment of my imagination. It's what I hoped would happen. It's the scene I sketched out in my book. But it's only fiction, I'm afraid. Real life turned out somewhat differently. Chapter 9 As I stood there, in the shadows, watching Kate climb the jetty steps, I had the first unpleasant inkling that reality was diverging from my plans for it. I felt a small, sharp jab in my back. I quickly turned around. Nikos was there, standing behind me. He was holding a gun on me, which he probed me with again, harder this time. When I saw it was him, I felt annoyed rather than concerned. Back off. Don't point that fucking thing at me. I thought Jason told you to stay in your cottage. Nikos ignored my words. He stared at me suspiciously. 
We find the others. He gestured for me to walk. Go. He nodded at the beach, in the direction of the jetty, and Jason and Kate. I immediately felt alarmed. No, I said quickly. Not that way. Not a good idea. Go. Nico stabbed me again with a gun. Now. No, listen. The police are coming. We need to find Leo and Agathe. I went on, slowly and emphatically, so he'd understand. You and me. We go back to the house, and we find them, okay? I went to point him in the right direction, but as soon as my hand moved, his gun was dug deep into my chest. He pressed it hard between my ribs. I could feel my heart thudding against it. Nikos wasn't fucking around. He nodded again at the jetty. Go, now. Okay, okay, calm down. Seeing I had no choice, I accepted my fate with a sigh. Like a sulky child, I walked down onto the beach. As we crossed the sand, Nikos kept close behind me, digging the gun into my back. He was suspicious of me, and rightly so. How stupid of me to let him catch me, lurking in the bushes, spying on Kate and Jason. It didn't look good, and now I'd have to talk my way out of it, and it wouldn't be easy. I'd have to improvise, which wasn't my strong suit. Damn him, I thought. He's ruining everything. We reached the jetty steps. I stopped, unwilling to go on. I felt the gun pressing in my back, forcing me up, step by step, until I stood there on the stone platform. I came face to face with Kate and Jason. Kate was still holding the gun, I noticed, and Jason didn't seem to object, so perhaps I'd been wrong about that. Kate looked from me to Nikos, with a look of disbelief mingled with revulsion. She turned to Jason. He said Nikos was dead. He said you killed him. What? Jason looked stunned. What? Elliot said you killed him, like you killed Lana. Jason gasped. What the fuck? What a snake you are, Elliot. Kate turned to me. What a fucking snake. I keep expecting you to hiss. Why don't you hiss? Kate, please stop. I can explain. I was about to begin to talk myself out of it when, over Jason's shoulder, I saw someone on the beach. My heart sank. It was Agathe. She was hurrying over to us. Now, it was all over. My entire house of cards was about to collapse around me in a heap. Nothing I could do now but resign myself to it. While I waited for Agathe to reach us, I turned my attention to Kate and Jason, who were talking about me as if I weren't there, which was disconcerting to say the least. I have often heard other writers describe their characters as getting away from them, behaving independently with a life of their own. I used to scorn this idea, roll my eyes at the pretension of it, but now, to my amazement, I was experiencing it myself. I kept wanting to interrupt them, say, No, no, you're not meant to be saying that, and this shouldn't be happening. But it was happening. This was reality, not a play, and it was not going as I'd planned. He's trying to frame you, Kate said. Lana left him millions of pounds. Did you know that? No, Jason looked furious. I did not. Agathe appeared at the top of the steps. She gave us all a frightened look. What's going on? We know who shot Lana, Kate said. Who? Agathe looked confused. Kate pointed at me with a gun. Elliot. Chapter 10 We stood there on the jetty, staring at one another. We remained in silence for a second. The only sounds were the wind wailing and the waves crashing around us. Behind Agathe's eyes, I could see her thinking hard, working out her next move. She spoke cautiously. Why would Elliot do that? Money, said Kate. He's broke. Lana told me. She said she left him a fortune. This was the one possibility I had never considered. That I might end up as the prime suspect. The irony was not lost on me. It took an effort to keep a straight face. I pulled myself together and presented them with a grave expression. I'm sorry to disappoint you. I am guilty of many things, but murdering Lana is not one of them. I gave Agathe a defiant look. Go on, I thought. Spill the beans. I bet you're dying to tell them it's all a charade. But Agathe remained silent, and a hopeful thought suddenly occurred to me. Was it possible that Lana had succeeded in winning her over? Might Agathe play along after all? Might she help me turn this around? Meanwhile, Kate was talking in a low, excited voice. Elliot killed her. He can't get away with this. He can't. He can't. He won't, said Jason. The police. Fuck the police. He'll talk his way out of it. He can't get away with it, Jason. We cannot let him. What are you talking about? 
I'm talking about justice. He killed Lana. You want to shoot him? Go ahead. Be my fucking guest. I mean it. So do I. There was a slight pause. This had gone far enough, I decided. I didn't like where it was heading, particularly as Kate was waving a loaded gun around. Things might easily get out of hand. So, very reluctantly, I felt compelled to end it. Ladies and gentlemen, I held up my hands. I hate to spoil the surprise, but I'm afraid this isn't real. This whole evening is a hoax. Lana isn't dead. It's just a joke. Jason looked at me with disgust. You're fucked in the head, mate. So he didn't believe me, which was, in a way, a tremendous compliment. I smiled. Fine. Ask Agathy if you don't believe me. She'll tell you. I glanced at her. Go on, tell them. Agathy met my gaze, unblinking. Tell them what? I frowned. Tell them the truth. Tell them Lana's alive. Agathy spat in my face. Murderer. I gasped, stunned. Agathy? You killed her, Agathy crossed herself. May God forgive you. I was incredulous and furious. I wiped my face. What the fuck are you playing at? Stop it now. Tell them the truth. But Agathy just stared at me with an insolent look. So I controlled my anger and turned to Jason. Come on, let's go back to the house. You'll find Lana alive and well, knocking back vodka, smoking Kate's bags, and... Jason punched me in the face, his fist connected with my jaw. The blow sent me staggering backward. I took a moment to steady myself. My hand went to my throbbing, aching jaw. The pain was intense. It hurt to speak. I think you broke my jaw. Fuck. I'm just getting started, mate, he said grimly. For Christ's sake. I glared at Agathy. Happy now? Satisfied? Now will you tell this fucking moron it's just a joke? Jason punched me again. This time, the blow caught the side of my head, knocking me off balance. I stumbled, falling onto my hands and knees. Blood spurted from my nose onto the sandy stone floor. I gasped, trying to catch my breath. I had been thrown off balance psychologically, as well as physically. I needed to adjust to the situations rapidly getting out of control. I could hear them talking above my head, and what I heard was unsettling, to say the least. They sounded weirdly excited, almost high. Well, said Jason, are we doing this? Yes or no? We have no choice, said Kate. He killed her. It's justice. And what do we tell the police? The truth. Elliot shot Lana. Then he shot himself. They had temporarily lost their minds, and I didn't believe for one second that they would actually go through with it. But despite reassuring myself, I was starting to feel scared. I had to get out of this. I pulled myself to my feet. I forced a smile, despite my aching jaw. Bravo! Quite a performance, guys. You almost got me. But this charade has gone on too long. Let me give you a tip. You mustn't let the final act drag on forever. You lose your audience. With that, I turned to go. And I heard a dull thud, then felt a crippling, spreading pain in my lower back. Nikos had hit me from behind with the handle of the gun. I sank to my knees with a groan. Hold him, said Jason. Don't let him go. Nikos grabbed my shoulders, holding me down on my knees. I struggled to free myself. Get the fuck off me. This is insane. I've done nothing wrong. They surrounded me. I could hear them above my head, talking in whispers. Justice, said Jason. Justice, repeated Kate. Starting to panic, I squirmed, fighting to turn my head to Agathy. I appealed to her. Why are you doing this? You proved your point, okay? I'm sorry. Now stop. But Agathy wouldn't look at me. Justice. She translated the word into Greek for Nikos. Tikaiosini. Tikaiosini. Nikos nodded. Justice. Jason nodded at the gun in Kate's hands. He needs to be holding the gun. Give it to me. Here, Kate handed it to him. Take it. Let me go. Lana is alive. I fought to get away, but Nikos held me there like a vice. I felt panic rising up inside me. Jason pressed the gun into my hand, keeping his hand over mine. He raised the gun to the side of my head. I could feel it digging deep into my temple. Pull the trigger, Elliot, he said. This is your punishment. Pull the trigger. I was fighting tears. No, no, I didn't do anything wrong. Please. Shh. Jason was being weirdly gentle now, even tender. Stop pretending now, he whispered in my ear. Do it. Pull the trigger. No, no. Pull the trigger, Elliot. No, I was sobbing now. Please, stop. Then I'll do it. No, said Kate. 
I will. Suddenly, I found myself staring into Kate's eyes. They were huge, wild, terrifying. This is for Lana, she hissed. No, no. And then, in absolute terror, I started to scream. I was screaming for Lana, of course. I had no idea if she was out of earshot, but she had to hear me. She had to save me. Lana! Lana! I felt Kate's fingers on the gun, slipping over mine, forcing my finger onto the trigger. I realized, with absolute certainty, that the sensation of Kate's fingers on mine, the gun against my head, the wind against my face, were the last things I'd ever feel. Lana! Kate pushed my finger down on the trigger. Lana! My scream was cut short. I heard a click, an enormous bang. Everything went dark, and my world disappeared.